We're here with the first inaugural episode of the Eclectic Approaches Physio Roundtable. And with me, I have Dr. Sean Wells. So how's Morning. it going today, Sean? I'm doing great. Things are going great today. How about you? Oh, things are going well. The reason why I have Sean on is because he was pretty much trolled by a couple of PTs. Specifically, you called them out as being like New York PTs. And I'm like, oh, what? what? What's wrong with New York? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's yeah, a lot of things wrong with New York, I could say, but well, I mean, a couple of PTs called him out um, because of his site. You know, he's the official modern nutritional rehab and his brand is also nutritional physical therapy. Um, and on his sites, you want to you want to give a quick recap what happened and then uh, your response. We'll talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'd received uh, an email from somebody who was on my newsletter and apparently they'd been opening and reading some of my, my blog posts and things, which is awesome. Uh, they haven't purchased a course, but still really love having people on there and reading my material and content. And uh, well, lo and behold, I get an email from him saying that I'm completely missing the mark and that uh, carnivore is the own, only way. And so uh, what he's referring to there is the carnivore diet. And around that same time, I also have a uh, chat function set up for my uh, my website and my courses so that when people have questions like, hey, Sean, you know, how many CEUs is this for? Or, hey, what's, you know, how do I access my website or whatever? Uh, usually that's the kind of short, quick questions I get. Well, this time around, I got some messages that, you know, were basically like your, your information is basically expletive junk and uh, carnivore is the only way. So around that same time, I'm getting flack around uh, and I'm getting this email. So I'm going putting two, two and two together that, you know, I've been kind of targeted by some carnivore groups and that's okay. Cause it's not my first time. Cause uh, in the past I've been critical of uh, CrossFit like many, many, many years ago. Uh, I remember that. Were, yeah. Especially when they were doing a lot of the uncontrolled box stuff and there wasn't a lot of regulation and things. I know things have changed now, but uh, especially with so many physios and PTs and, and, and boxes now. But uh, even when I criticized back then about how they needed to improve their process, I was targeted and my practice was targeted as well, even with bad reviews and people that I've never even seen. So it's not my first rodeo with uh, being criticized, but it's certainly uh, eye-opening because in this case, the carnivore diet is uh, definitely an extreme fad diet. It's not something that is uh, really safe or uh, really warranted in many populations. So what would you say um, to people who say like, oh, I've tried the carnivore diet, right? This is all like anecdotal, right? I've tried the carnivore diet and I've never had more energy and I have this clarity and all these benefits you supposedly get for them. What would you say to that? So, you know, usually I respond, that's great. That worked for you. And obviously every person's physiology is different. Um, however, we often see with any dietary manipulation, we often see improvements in a lot of those qualitative functions of like brain fog, feeling of tiredness or fatigue. And we don't necessarily understand why, but we do have inferences that a couple things. One, we know that when actually people start paying attention to their diet and they're more aware of what they're eating, they actually can lose weight and their quality of diet improves. So that's one factor. Second factor is we know that when we shift, particularly macros in that extreme, so going from no carbohydrates to, or excuse me, carbohydrates to no carbohydrates, um, you're obviously utilizing different fuel systems, right? So you're shifting to, uh, you know, carbohydrates to using more gluconeogenesis to produce ketones. So you, you get some shift in that regard. Uh, thirdly, you get a shift in the gut microbiome. So with that, your gut bacteria changes. So the talk between your, your gut and your brain changes. So those short-term factors happen with almost any short-term diet change. Now, the question is, what happens over the long-term? And that's really where I think the issue is. It's not necessarily that 30-day window of time or that you know, two-week period of time that you went carnivore. It's really, how do you feel after two years? Right. Not only how do you feel after two years, but I mean... I would also say similar to like manual therapy or even treatment, you know, is there a placebo effect of I'm, I'm doing this. I heard it was good for me and I feel great. Um, obviously there's a lot of other factors, but I, I can't discount that factor too, um, right. for there being like just non-specific, uh, effects, not even actual effects. But, um, I always like to tell people that, you know, any kind of structured diet without knowing what your diet was like before, you can only assume typically that it's a typical Western diet. 
meaning that it's not healthy. There's processed foods, um, high sugars, high carbs, things like that. And then you go to, uh, you know, when I look at studies back when I was very heavily plant-based, like 90, 90% or something, cause I'm, I'm not as much plant-based anymore. Um, mm -hmm. but back when I was heavily getting into studying plant-based diets and uh, looking at studies like plant-based diet versus vegetarian diet versus a whole, a uh, whole 30 diet, or I forget what it's called versus just a Mediterranean diet. Every single group improves equally across like all kinds of biomarkers and blood work and everything, because yeah. again, it, it's typically just a structured diet that eliminates most of the bad things you shouldn't be eating. Yeah. I mean, Kevin Hall has been looking at this for several years, looking at basically trying to get from a processed diet or ultra processed diet, which is kind of standard American to a process to, you know, basically a whole foods type diet. And then, you know, a lot of his studies have looked at um, particularly, okay, is it going to be low carb, high carb, or just a balanced and like overall, what really was the big kind of qualifying factor was how processed the foods were. And um, I know his, I'm summarizing uh, like probably 10 years of his research into like two sentences. There's been several trials and studies that he's done that to culminate that evidence, but he's been probably our premier person. So uh, in a way, he sort of put a nail in the coffin of like, well, it's got to be low carb. It's got to be high carb or no, it's got to be mostly minimally processed foods that uh, that you need to be consuming. And so that's that's part of why with carnivore, there's an appeal because it you know someone might say, hey, it's it's meat, right? You know, it's minimally processed. Uh, some meat is right. Just like saying carb is a carb is a carb and not necessarily, you know, we know that there's a difference between eating table sugar and eating a mango. The mango has nutrients, fiber and water, whereas the sugar has pretty much just devoid of any nutrients. So uh, not all meat is created equally, e equally either. And solely eating meat has a lot of pitfalls. And as I mentioned in the, uh, my article that I wrote in response to these physical therapists, uh, it's devoid of fiber, uh, that dietary pattern. It's devoid of certain nutrients, and it can lead to constipation as, as well as other issues. I think a lot of people go into this diet because there's concerns around grains, particularly, and uh, concerned around carbohydrates. And um, when you really look at it, it's this is not a new diet. I know Sean Baker would love to sort of, he's the orthopedic surgeon who created the carnivore book, who created the carnivore diet. He'd love to stake the claim stake the claim, literally, um, <laughs> that he created this diet, but re really originated from a German scientist in the 1800s who did basically a meat and water only diet and several other derivations of that diet in, I think, in Italy as well. They used to use it for diarrheal disease to try to get somebody basically constipated from probably pooping too much from uh, typhoid or cholera or something like that. So obviously it works in terms of making you more constipated because you're able to give people lots of meat and lots of water and then keep them from having uh, a lot of diarrhea. Uh, so this is not the very first time we've seen this diet. And just like we've seen in so many fad diets like Atkins and the grapefruit diet, the rice diet, it's usually, you know, extreme limitation of one or some, some other substances uh, with some health claim and usually some book or media production, or in this case, it's kind of a brand he's built now. Uh, with TikTok videos, merch, you know, that whole kit and caboodle that we see within um, uh, kind of current contemporary social media uh, apparatuses. So it, it's it's not something new, but also people feel like it's something new, it's something different. And so they get excited about it. And it's, it's understandable. People got excited about Atkins, came and went. And uh, now we've had vari variations of that, right? Zone diet, South Beach diet. Um, but I think ultimately, like you said, if you can find a dietary pattern that works for you, that's sustainable, that is minimally processed and, uh, can meet multiple nutrient, uh, nutrient needs, then that's probably the ideal diet for you. Uh, the carnivore diet, unfortunately, just doesn't tick those boxes. And over the long term, even, even devout followers of this diet have said, you know, after several years, it's bland, it's difficult, it's not easy to sustain. And ultimately that's not a diet that you want to be on. Right. The sustainability, I think, would be difficult, even if it was, let's just say, even if it's um, somehow encapsulated your fiber needs um, and and other just vitamin <laughs> nutritional needs, is it sustainable? Right. I mean, you have to the, the diet, the diet that is best for you, if it is bland and you can't adhere to it, 
it's useless just like the exercise right like what they say about what is the most exercise what is the most effective exercise program it's the one that you enjoy it's the one that you're going to exactly. be motivated enough to do because yeah. if you don't if you're not motivated enough to to stick with these things and actually like create a lasting behavioral change it doesn't matter how good it is for you because you have you have to stick to it absolutely and that's that's probably in terms of my argument that's probably the strongest argument obviously with all the other nutrient and scientific facts that are there like you know not having vitamin c not having magnesium not having fiber uh which plenty of dietitians and healthcare providers have pointed out uh, like i cited uh the uh gentleman um uh, jonathan jerry's article from 2018 that he published on uh, mcgill university's website the carnivore diet a beefy leap of faith if, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that but he dives into some of the myths around the carnivore diet like you know how vegetables are poisonous to us because of phytic acid and other compounds that sort of bind and block certain nutrients it's really not a lot of evidence it's very theoretical and um you know if that was the case i would say then why is there evidence that like the mediterranean diet which has you know thousands of published articles showing its effectiveness how's that worked over years because there's both carbs there and meat you know and most of that meat is mostly oily fish occasionally some dairy and eggs so that being said like you know there's just not a lot of arguments and i know they oftentimes will sort of pigeonhole us into certain populations like the inuit well or, or the african tribes but those those individuals are so far outside of our modern society they don't have the same exposure to ultra processed foods they don't have the same exposure to the marketing that we are so i think those are extreme also, they, sort of yeah they're same thing with their by their their gut biome is mm -hmm. is probably largely different from ours um and Correct. even someone on my facebook page they, they did reference those two tribes um saying how uh particularly the maasai tribe they only eat meat and honey. But yeah. I'm like, well, meat and honey is not only meat. Right. Exactly. Because because like the local um, I mean, I'm not aware of any studies on this, but I know that um I've heard things like this where um just bees take on like the the local kind of flora and fauna. And, and so it's possible that any nutritional needs they may have from vegetables or or fiber or fruit or anything could potentially be in the honey but again the gut biome probably large wildly different than our typical kind of western gut biome uh and, and you know it's even even individual people they do stuff like yeah. they take they take like the the particular gut floor of an obese in of an obese individual and they transfer it into like a skinny individual or, or vice versa and and they start to lose weight or gain weight right so yeah, it's a very individualized that the, kind of thing. The Maasai tribe, they actually they do eat honey, which is a carbohydrate, right? But they also they are known for eating tubers. Now, do they cultivate their crops? Do they go out and like grow fields of corn? No. So their diet is not sustained on that like large agricultural grain model, kind of like a lot of our our Western cultures are. But they still eat tubers, which typically are roots that are starchy and fibrous. So uh again i think we're kind of cherry picking some of that that the tribal data and into inuits up in uh particularly uh in north america they tend to eat blubber and a lot of the blubber uh, does have a lot of marine marine based exposure and there's some seaweed involved too so it's not just simply eating nothing but steak or eggs or dairy so uh, of course they don't have steak and dairy up there it's too hard to have that so there's these extreme circumstances and kind of an exercise corollary we wouldn't pull a study from jospt on triathletes and then translate that to my you know 101 year old grandma it's just the populations are very different maybe we draw, draw some inferences or some ideas and concepts but it's pretty far-fetched and uh unfortunately that that doesn't hold water right all right hey if you guys found our discussion useful you want us to talk about anything else any other questions nutritional um we plan on doing physio roundtable uh hopefully regularly um yeah. and then uh, yeah we'll have the manual therapy expert nutritional the patient education uh, bfr and barbell so that's our that's our shtick at the eclectic approach make sure to submit your questions online anywhere on our socials via email or dm us on um on various uh, social channels have a good one all right you too bye